Amen. Thanks so much, guys. Just want to offer my happy Father's Day to all the dads here today. In fact, can we give another massive applause to all the dads who are in the house? We honor you guys and love you guys. And just thankful for my dad and my father-in-law. They would just do anything for me and our family. And then so many dads here are inspirations to me. And so we're just so thankful for you. I just hope your day is filled with steaks and ribs and mashed potatoes and gravy and beans and foot massages, right? Just uh, all, and all at one time, at one, at one time. I'm actually thinking about going on the road full time as a comedian specializing in dad jokes. And so I thought what I'd do on this Father's Day is share some dad jokes with you. And so I'm looking for some feedback from you on if these are good dad jokes or not to include in my soon to come world comedic tour of, of dad jokes. And so I'm going to share some different jokes with you. If they're good, I'm looking for your feedback to like scream, yell, cheer, give me thumbs up. Yes. Include this in my routine. If it's a bad joke, cut it. Then give me a boo or a thumbs down or something like that. Then I won't include this in my routine. So uh, there was three dads, three guys, they were in the hospital waiting room waiting for uh, their wife to give birth to their child. And a nurse walks in and says, is, is so-and-so here? And one of the dads says, yeah, that, that's me. And, and she says, I've got great news for you. Your wife just gave birth to twins. You have, you have twins. And the dad's like, that is awesome and amazing. I'm so stoked. And it's actually really ironic too, because I'm actually the third baseman of the Minnesota Twins. And I'm, I'm on the Twins team and I have twins. That's just, that, that's amazing. And then about 20 minutes later, she comes in again and, and says, is, is so-and-so here? And, and one of the guys says, yeah, that, that's me. And the nurse says, congratulations. Your wife just gave birth to, to triplets. You have three babies, tri triplets. And he says, wow, that's, that's awesome and really ironic as well because I actually work for the 3M company and I'm going to have triplets. At that exact moment, the third dad, he fell out of his seat onto the floor and just started to moan. <laughs> and the nurse is like, well, 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 are you okay? What's wrong? He says, I'm fine, but I work for the 7-Up company. <laughs> Okay, keep that. Okay, that's it. That's it. Let's, let's keep the momentum going. Here's my next one. Okay, here we go. When is the best time to call your dentist? 2.30. No. No. Boo? Okay, boo. Okay. Funny, that first service cut that one from my routine as well. So, okay, I'll cut that one. Okay, how do mice floss their teeth? With string cheese. No? no? no. Cut it? Keep it? Cut it. Okay, okay, here we go. How do you make an egg roll? You push it. No? No, okay, here we go. Last one, last one. Here we go. Here we go. How can you tell if a pig is hot? It's bacon. There we go. I'll be here all day. I'll be here all day. If you're looking for something this afternoon, come back, 3 o'clock, special show. Okay, let's turn to Genesis 49, shall we? Genesis 49, if you've got your Bibles or uh, devices, it'll also be on the screen. Think this is just a good passage to maybe challenge us as dads, inspire us as dads, as, as men, as guys. Uh, here, uh, Jacob is nearing the end of his life. Uh, he will die somewhere around the age of 147. And he is doing here what was typical of Jewish culture. He is gathering his sons together and really speaking speaking prophetically over them. Uh, Jacob, God will rename him Israel. And he had 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. And he's really just kind of looking at their life and then speaking about what's on the horizon for uh, their life. And I want to just draw out a few of them and, and, and talk about them here today. So let's talk about verses one through seven first. Then Jacob called for his sons and said, gather around so I can tell you what will happen to you in the days to come. Assemble, listen, sons of Jacob, listen to your father Israel. There's that Jacob Israel. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the first sign of my strength, excelling in honor, excelling in power, 
turbulent as the waters, you will no longer excel. For you went into your father's bed onto my couch and defiled it. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence. Let me not enter their council. Let me not join their assembly. For they have killed men in their anger and hamstrung oxen as they please. Cursed be their anger so fierce and their fury so cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. So he starts with, with Reuben, his firstborn. Raise your hand if you are the oldest sibling in your family, all the oldest kids, okay? Middle siblings, would you raise your hand? Middle siblings, okay? Youngest siblings, unite, okay? I'm the youngest. Pray for Grace. Grace in our family, she's the only one in our family who is not the youngest sibling. So we're, we're all youngest siblings. Well, you got Reuben. He's the firstborn here. And my guess is, as his father is speaking over him at the start, he's feeling pretty good because Jacob says, listen, Re Reuben, you're my might. You're my strength. You, you excel in honor. You excel in power. He's probably thinking, you know it. But then he says, turbulent as the waters, you will no longer excel for you went into your father's bed onto my couch and defiled it. Reuben, as the oldest, as the firstborn, would have had the rights of the firstborn and the blessings that came with that. But it says here, you, you will no longer excel because you went into, my, into uh, my, my bed and defiled it. That is speaking of Genesis chapter 35. When Reuben slept with his dad's concubine, Billah, when, when, when Jacob was in grieving because his favorite wife had passed away, Reuben slept with his dad's concubine. And so he says the result of that is you are losing the rights of the firstborn. And it says that, that you will no longer excel. And we know that that is true. In fact, what we know of, no, no judges or kings or rulers came from the tribe of Reuben. And then Simeon and Levi, they're, they're next. They're around their pops who is nearing his death. And he says, you, you're, you're, their swords are, are weapons of violence. You have killed men in your anger and I will scatter you and disperse you. So what is that talking about? That's talking about Genesis 34. And here's what down that that is speaking of in Genesis and that account. Simeon and Levi, their sister Dinah was raped by the Shechemites. Now, we can all understand the, the, the emotion and probably appreciate the emotion that these brothers were feeling. And we also need to remember that things were different in biblical times, and so they sought vengeance. And so they went to the Shechemites, who had raped their sister, and they kind of hatched this plan. They say, listen, how does this sound to you? Why don't we start to intermarry between Jewish culture and the Shechemites? So Jewish men can marry Shechemite women and Shechemite men can marry Jewish women and the Shechemites are like, yeah, that sounds great. And, and Simeon and Levi, they're like, yo, there's just one thing you've got to, to do. Because we're Jewish, you all have to get circumcised. And, and, and the Shechemites, they, they don't even think about it. They don't even see if it's covered with insurance. They just, oh yeah, we'll do it. And so they get circumcised by these guys, and three days later, they are in massive pain, unable to fight, and Simeon and Levi and the whole crew, they come and then just, just demolish the Shechemites. Okay, now again, we, we, we understand the emotion and their feelings, but, but here's what Jacob knew, what the Lord knew, is, is that they went far beyond retaliation. They cherished and loved violence. And so he's speaking that. He says, so, so you're going to be dispersed. You, you went far above and beyond. You just, you just wipe people out. You just love violence. And so you're going to be dispersed. So what we know is that, that Simeon's tribe, they did. They, they started out as one of the largest in numbers one. But within 35 years, they're one of the smallest tribes. And so again, Jacob's just saying, just looking at their life and what will, will come on the horizon because of their life. And if you're a dad or a guy here, can I encourage you to write this down somewhere in your notes? The life that we live is the legacy we leave. The life that we live is the legacy that we leave. 
Think, think about it with me. Legacy is one of those things that, that we, have, we, we have no choice in. Every person here will leave a legacy. Every person. And I think this, this actually applies not just to, to us as guys or dads or husbands, but, but to, to wives and, and moms and, and friends and employees and employers and business owners and all that. All of us will leave a legacy. We have no choice. The only choice that we have is what type of legacy will we leave? Now, now that we do have a choice in. And the life that we live determines the legacy that we leave. And the Bible actually, I, I'm, I'm inspired by, by Psalm 48, speaking of the importance of just, just passing down legacy. It says, we will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget their deeds, but would keep his commands. It's pretty remarkable when you think about the fact that, that how we live our life, spiritually speaking, can bless generations that will follow us. People whom we will not meet this side of heaven. Carrie and I have actually been the recipients of this in our own life. On Carrie's side, she has a great grandpa, Walter. And, and, and I think about the impact that her great grandpa, Walter, has had on our daughters, Grace and Kylie. Now, track with me that Grace and Kylie never met Carrie's great-grandpa, Walter. But her great-grandpa, Walter, was a godly man, and he made a massive impact on Carrie's grandma. He, he made a massive impact on her life, and she would have been uh, his daughter-in-law. Carrie's grandma married Grandpa Walter's son. And as his daughter-in-law, her father-in-law made a great spiritual impact on her life, on Carrie's grandma. Carrie's grandma then made a great spiritual impact on Carrie's mom's life. And both Carrie's grandma and Carrie's mom have both made a significant impact on Grace and Kylie's life. So even though great-grandpa Walter Never met, never knew Grace and Kylie. They don't even, they would know him if he walked in here right now, even though he passed away years ago. He had a significant impact on their life. Because the life that he lived was a legacy they left. He passed down faith to his kids and to his grandkids. And that kept going. I think about it on my side of the family. My great grandma Smith. My daughters have, have no knowledge of my great-grandma Smith. Yet my great-grandma Smith impacted their life. Because she impressed faith on my grandma. Who then impressed faith on her five kids, my dad being one of them, raised them as a single mom because my grandpa peaced out. And, and she impressed faith on five kids, my dad being one of them. And now my dad has had a massive impact on Grace and Kylie's life. And so the, the Bible really invites us and challenges us to think like, like generationally. To think beyond the, the here and the now. To think about the legacy that I'm leaving for my, my kids and my grandkids and my great-grandkids. To be praying for and standing just in faith for those generations of my family that will never meet me, but I can still impact their life. How, how can we do that? I've got just a couple quick thoughts if, if you want to jot them down. Dads, I thought, number one, we need to live with intentionality. Live with intentionality. We, we, we can't afford just to be just aimless, to wander. We have to be purposeful and focused on what, what really matters in life. Secondly, we need to become our family's spiritual leader. It doesn't mean that we're perfect. 
It simply means that we're authentic and that we honor God in our home and do everything we can to honor Christ in our home and uplift the name of Jesus in our home. And then then number three, be the primary encourager of our family. Think of it like like a bank account. Encouragement into our kids is a deposit. Discipline, correction is a withdrawal. Well, we want there to be a lot of currency in our kids from just encouragement that we're speaking into them. The life that we live is the legacy that we leave. Go with me now to verses 8 through 12. It says, Judah, your, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the, the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will, will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, Judah. You return from uh, the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness, who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nation shall be his. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. He will wash his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. And so now you, you got Reuben, you got Simeon, you got Levi, and they've kind of, you know, forfeited their position. And so now you got Judah. Now there's a couple things that I think are, are, are unique and impactful and good to know about this section of verses right here with Judah. First of all, they have a messianic nature to them in that they point to Jesus. That's, that's probably most important to think about. In fact, Charles Spurgeon said that when you look at these verses, they, in their greatest fulfillment, they speak of who Jesus is. Because Revelation says that Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. So some 18 years after, 1,800 years after this, Jesus would arrive on the scene from the, the line of, of Judah. Now what's kind of crazy, in fact, in fact it says, it, there's like a Palm Sunday reference there when you look there. It says that he will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. That's kind of a shout out to Palm Sunday even right there. Now again, what, what's, what's important to consider is this. Judah wasn't a perfect dude. He actually has a checkered past. I mean, think about it. He, he actually kind of recommended the prophet plan to sell his brother Joseph. We'll talk about Joseph in a moment. And then above that, when his daughter-in-law was, was dressed up as a prostitute, he didn't know it was his daughter-in-law, but he engaged with this prostitute. And so Judah wasn't perfect. In fact, if you were going to pick one of the the sons for the line of Jesus to come from, I don't think it would be Judah. It'd probably be be Joseph. But God sovereignly and supernaturally chose the line of Judah. Now, what is also kind of cool, I think, if you reflect upon it, is we do see some redemption in Judah's life. Because he, he would, later on, he would offer himself in place of Benjamin when, when they were trying to engage and, and, and bring their dad with them to Egypt. And so you see this, this redemption story as well where Judah goes from selfish to more selfless. And so here's the encouragement for us, I think, today as dads to write this down. Number two, Jesus redeems our story. Jesus redeems our story. Dads, the, 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 there is not one of us here who is perfect. All of us fall short. All of us make mistakes. We are not perfect, but God is perfecting us. And the beautiful thing about just the gospel is that this, there's mercy and there's grace and there's forgiveness and there's a fresh start. There's redemption in our life. And, and I don't think that this conflicts with the first point. Is it true that how we live our life matters? Yes. Is it true that our life choices have consequences? Yes. Is it true that we serve a God of grace who gives us a fresh start and a a great future to look forward to? Yes. All of those things are, are yes. And so here's a takeaway for us. No matter where we are today, today is the best day to start living for a godly legacy. Today. 
Well, whether you're 60, 70 years old and have just recently come to faith in Christ, today is the best day to live for a godly legacy. Today going forward. If you are 14, 15 years old, man, can you hear my heart as your pastor? Today is the best day to start to live for a godly legacy as a young person. If you'll make a commitment in your heart right now, I will serve Jesus I will be a person of character and conviction and Christ like this. There's great things that God has for me on the horizon. And I'm going to live with a, a bigger picture than just the here and now. I want to glorify God with my life. You will be so glad that you did. Today is the day to begin to live for a godly legacy. What he then does, the, 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 the rest of, of this chapter is speak to the different sons, but I want to focus just in our remaining moments here on, on Joseph in, in verse 22. He says, Joseph is a fruitful vine, a fruitful vine near a spring whose branches climb over a wall. With bitterness, archers attacked him. They shot at him with hostility, but his bow remained steady. His strong arm stayed limber because of the hand of the mighty one of Jacob, because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel, because of your father's God who helps you because of the Almighty who blesses you with blessings of the skies above, blessings of the deep springs below, blessings of the breast and womb. Your Father's blessings are greater than the blessings of the ancient mountains, than the bounty of the age-old hills. Let all these rest on the head of Joseph, on the brow of the prince, among his brothers. And so now he speaks of, of Joseph. And, and Joseph is a pretty incredible story, an incredible narrative from like Genesis 38 through, through 49 or 50. But he was this dude who, who his, basically his brother sold him into slavery. He was then sold by the Midianites. He finds himself in Potiphar's home. He, he really rises to a place of prominence, but Potiphar's wife takes notice of him, tries to seduce him. He rejects uh, her seduction. I love what he says there. He says, how could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? But because of that, Potiphar's wife accuses him of rape. He's thrown in prison. Because of his character, he, he rises to a place of prominence in the prison. Pharaoh has a dream. God allows Joseph to, to interpret that dream and basically says, listen, there's seven years of abundance coming, followed by seven years of famine. So you need to prepare and get ready as an Egyptian kingdom. Because of that, Joseph is placed in a prominent place in, in Egypt. They store up grain during uh, the good times. They're prepared for the famine. And around that time, Joseph's brothers, the ones who sold him into slavery, come because they need food. Now, had that been me, had I been Joseph and my broskies who sold me into slavery, now need my help, and things had worked out okay for me, I'd be like, how do you like me now? But that's why you don't find my name anywhere in the Bible. But Joseph says, man, the, these things were done so that God might be glorified. And he forgives them and, and he cares for them. And in fact, when you study, Joseph is actually called referred to what is called a, a type of Christ, which simply means that he is someone in the Old Testament that we can look to and we just see just examples of just, man, just the love of Jesus is in that person. The love of God is in that person. Because Joseph was betrayed. Jesus was betrayed. Joseph forgave his betrayers. Jesus forgave his betrayers. Joseph was wrongly accused, and, and so was Jesus. And yet, in, in all of his life, you see just character. You see integrity. Can I encourage all of us dads to write down this point number three? Be the example of the character traits that we want to see in our kids. Be the example of the character traits that you want to see in your kids. We, we, we've heard that phrase, more is caught than taught. Again, not, not one of us, dads is perfect, but make it our heart or ambition to be the example of the character traits that we want to see in our kids. And if we, we want our kids to, to
to have a, a godly home one day that we need to model that in, in what, what we watch and what we listen to. What, what, what hobbies and activities do we want our kids to be a part of that we need to model that. If we want our grandkids to be raised in church, then we need to raise our kids in church. We need to be those models and those examples. And so many of you dads just live this out in such an awesome way and are just great examples for, for other dads like, like myself. In 2003, you might remember Hurricane Isabel, which just a hurricane that wiped out, went through the East Coast. And, and it kind of went, went by Washington, D.C., and, and I think 16 people passed away. Millions of people lost power. And, and they actually relocated some of the Senate and, and, and the president when it was going to kind of cross that path. And they went to the soldiers who were standing, attention at the tomb of the unknown. You know that there's, there's soldiers that stand at the tomb of the unknown every hour of every day since 1937. And they went to those soldiers who were there as this hurricane was gonna come through that area and said, you can go and seek shelter somewhere else. But they refused to leave their post. They, they stood right there as someone had done every hour since 1937. And I think that's a picture of really what we need from men today. Men who will recognize the storm, recognize culture, but will stand firm for Christ in the midst of the culture. I want to invite you to stand to your feet with me today. And just as was reflecting upon Father's Day and just how we can kind of just pray and close, I thought... I think we need to pray for all of the guys. And so I want to just invite uh, every, every guy who is here, young and old, just to come across the front here right now, just to get out of your seats and come across the front because we want to just pray for you. I'm going to invite Everett Garza to, to, to grab a mic and come up on stage with me. I'm asking him. So if every, every guy, just come out right now, just come across the front right now. And I want us just to have a special uh, moment of prayer for all of the guys here because just come super close get in tight in here and I'm going to have all the gals stretch their hands towards these guys in a moment we're just going to pray blessing and favor and strength and courage and Everett's going to come up right up here by me brother and, and uh, because godly men are needed now is as much ever before. That, that's really, I think, what the kingdom of God needs is godly men who will stand strong. And actually, I actually love th this quote. Look at this quote from, from James Dobson, founder of Focus on the Family. Here, here's, what, here's what James Dobson said. He said, the Western world stands at a great crossroads in its history. It is my opinion that our very survival as a people will depend upon the presence or absence of masculine leadership in millions of homes. I believe with everything in me that husbands hold the keys to the preservation of the family. And so we want to pray strength and courage and blessing and covering over you, over all of us, over our families, believing God that just legacies and households and generations to come will be impacted by every guy here standing strong in the storm. Ever, would you open and then I'll close. Praise God. Would you join yes. me in extending yes, your me. arms thank over you. to these men of God Thank you. and all the fathers that we are. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. Thank you for the fathers that we have here in our presence and those that are online watching. Yes. We thank you for the privilege and honor to be called father, to be called dad, yes, to be called papi. We thank you because you are building up men of God as an example to their children. Without you, Lord, it's impossible. It is difficult. But with you guiding us and giving us direction, Father God, we can do it. Yes. We pray that you build up these men of God to be 
men of honor, integrity, and purity. Men that seek you in all things. Seek your Holy Spirit for answers that they may have, their children may have. We thank you, Father God, because you're building up spiritual leaders in these homes. Yes. That in times of difficulties, in times when the storm may come, they humble themselves, drop to their knees, and pray alongside their families. We thank you, Father God, because you're building relationships, father-daughter, father-son relationships, yep. yes. strong relationships. Yes. yes. Open our minds and our hearts to realize that it's important to communicate to our kids, to spend quality time with our kids, Father God. Thank you for everything that you've done in our families. We pray blessings upon blessings for all the fathers here. We also pray, Father God, for healing, for healing in a relationship of yes. a father-son and a father-daughter that may have been broken. We pray that you, Father God, intercede. You bring grace and understanding yes. Yes. and peace yes. and forgiveness and above all, love, Father God. We thank you for all these fathers in precious name. Yes, Lord, we just lift up these men. Lord, we pray just your blessing and, and strength and courage over them. Lord, I, I pray for those that, that have been honored to have a, a legacy of faith passed down to them. I pray that you'd help them to, to lean on you and continue to live out that godly legacy. That they would pass that down to their kids and to their grandkids like it's been passed down to them. But we also take a moment and pray for those who, who are standing up front right now and, and, and maybe they have not had that godly legacy. But Lord, I pray that you give them just a heart of enthusiasm and conviction that they will be the ones to start it. That their kids and their grandkids and their great grandkids will look back years upon years from now and, and speak their name as the one who began the legacy of Christ like this in their family. So I pray that you'd give them a holy conviction to say, Lord, I want to be that person. I want to be that dad, that grandpa, that man. And Lord, we just pray blessings over all of these guys, young to old. I pray the young people up here right now will gain a holy conviction of how you will use their life and they will love you and have a white hot passion to serve you and you only. May they experience your best plans and purposes for their life. And we pray covering and protection and safety over every man physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, relationally, financially, sexually. Would you cover them in every way so we could stand strong in the storms of culture for you, for you and for our kids, for our wife and for our grandkids. May you be glorified. Thank you for these men. Many of them just inspire me, challenge me. I thank you for their lives. Bless them, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Come on, can we give God praise here this morning? Amen, amen. Listen, men, we love you guys so much. And uh, in honor of you, we've got ice cream for you as you leave the worship center today. So we got a, a morning ice cream for you. And we got a photo booth in the lobby. Happy Father's Day, guys. We love you so much. Have a beautiful one.